Welcome to Purple Chats, a podcast brought to you by the Fuels Institute. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Carpool Chats. I'm John Eichberg with the Fuels Institute. Today, we are joined by John Vyth, Director of Investment Banking at Raymond James & Associates, and my colleague, Jeff Hovey, the Vice President at the Fuels Institute. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today in Carpool Chats. Thank you, John. Good to be here, John. And John, let's start with you. So uh, we talk about the transportation sector all the time on this program, but you're portfolio from Raymond James and Associates much broader than that. So you guys are looking at a big swath of what's going on in the market. When I say ESG, what does that mean to you? And what do we need to be thinking about when we are trying to get our arms wrapped around this concept? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, my, my particular role is is uh, in the investment banking group, and we're primarily focused on, on mergers and acquisitions. So, um, there, there's also an element of what we do tied to uh, capital raising in, in the public um, public capital markets. So, you know, as I, I as I think about ESG, when we're um, you know pursuing uh, a sale of a, a company or, or helping on the buy side for a for a major consolidator, you know, looking to go after a target, um, you know, ESG really means you know, how more or less a company is, uh, is aligned from a value perspective around some of these, uh, um, you know, key, key social consciousness guidelines. So environmental, social and, and governance, um, you know, does, does the, the company report adequately on, on how, um, how carbon intensive its operations are from, from a social standpoint? Uh, are there diversity and inclusion initiatives at, at the highest levels of, of the company that, that uh, folks are paying attention to? And, and you know, uh, governance standpoint, you know, is, is there, you know, pro- proper uh, protocols at the, you know, highest echelons of a company that, that you know, are in line with, with best, of, uh, best of class operations and standards today? So it's... It's a um, it's it's a very broad reaching concept, and you know it's it's uh, it's it's nothing new. Of course, it's been around for a very long time, and um, it's it's a it's a major component of, of the, the public capital markets. Um, you know, j- just yesterday there was a uh, an activist shareholder, uh, Third Point, which is run by by Daniel Loeb, who took a five hundred million dollar position in. in shell and is lobbying for its breakup so so you see it um front and center on the front page of the wall street journal it's out there um folks taking positions in in companies looking to um advance uh goals that are that are more in line with with either the the investments organizational values or or uh realigning the um Realigning the, the capital allocation priorities of, of these companies to to align with with investors and so forth. So, you know, it, it, it's out there and it started at the at the top with with major um, large cap companies um, and you know ultimately um, you know we view it as something here to stay that that should make its way all the way to uh, to, to the smaller folks. So Jeff, maybe some of the people watching have heard corporate social responsibility. This is kind of CSR and steroids the way I look at it. But I mean, there are consequences to this. So you hear, you know, what John just said, you think, okay, sounds good. Sounds, you know, like a social movement, sounds like the other things we see in society happening, but there's some teeth behind it. It's not it's not regulated yet. I don't believe, but there are teeth being brought to this for publicly traded companies, as John mentioned, but also privately traded, uh, privately held companies are needing to pay attention to this. So where is the momentum coming from? Where is the pressure kind of being applied to companies to take this seriously? Yeah, that's a really good point, John, because it's, it's such a unique situation. It's, you know, normally industry is used to policy driven scenarios or schemas. And this is something that's really void of what's going on in D.C. or or other policy, you know, at the state level. It's really being driven by the financial institutions. So 
if you are anywhere in the supply chain, so you can be a privately held company, for example, and if you're doing business with a publicly traded company that's directly impacted by investors and, and other things, that publicly traded company is going to be asking for your ESG because they want to roll in your metrics. And, and if you're doing something that is positive, especially on the emission side of things, the greenhouse gas CO2 emission side of things, they want to bring that into, into their ESG report as well. So you have that, that relationship. Uh, in that supply chain relationship that is that is growing and and all the way to the point where we're seeing folks that are trying to bid on a fuel supply contract. And one of the prerequisites to even put your bid in to the hat is an ESG plan. Um, and we're seeing that with some of the like the large data centers, whether it's Facebook, micro, Microsoft, Amazon, you know, some of these other larger tech groups are, are demanding fuel suppliers, uh, you know, have an ESG plan. The other, the other areas that we're seeing, seeing it is with lending institutions, preferred lending terms and con, uh, conditions for those that have an ESG plan versus those that do not. And it's, it's, it's just really crazy to, to look at that. But what the, what the lenders and the financial institutions are ultimately saying is, what is your risk? So ESG turns into this risk assessment tool, and it's no longer looking at the immediate risks posed by, you know, that could potentially occur in your company, but they want to start bringing in the long-term risks of, of climate change and, and, and all of, you know, everything that goes out beyond that. So, um, you know, a lot of pressures coming on industry from areas we're not used to seeing those pressures come. And it's it's a very unique situation. So your comment about supply chain, you know, you see these announcements, these big Fortune 500, Fortune 5 companies, whatever, saying we're going to work our pledge is net zero carbon by X date. And, you know, you read that in the journal, you read that in the papers and hear on the news, you go, OK, that's great for them. Good job. The trickle down impact of that you don't really think about because you know if you're a massive corporation like that you're making a pledge you're looking upstream and downstream not only at your own operations and that's going to have residual effects on everybody you do do business with right that's that's exactly how it's how it's panning out that's exactly the way it's going right now yeah john you mentioned you guys deal a lot with m a um and with esg kind of popping up in almost all iterations of business. Are we starting to see some deals possibly be jeopardized if one of the parties doesn't have an ESG plan? Is that, are we getting to that level? I mean, Jeff mentioned that some terms of financing and loan uh, terms may be skewed depending on your ESG uh, plan program and, and reporting yeah. metrics, but is that starting to really have an effect on the whole M&A and what's viable, what's not? Yeah, I think, um... You know, I, I think deals that are on the fringe and aren't necessarily layups, more more on the cusp of, of being a, a great opportunity. Uh, if if the ESG component's not lining up, that, that's that's going to be tougher to get through an investment committee, for, for instance, at a at a major private equity fund. Um, as as M and A practitioners, I mean, we it's part of our, our DNA. Um, we believe that that competition drives the best outcomes. And um, in, in order to widen the net as, as wide as it possibly can, a good good thought process around um, not just what, you, what you're doing now, but, but some of the things that, that Jeff was talking about, you know, being cognizant of the longer term risk, being cognizant of, of, you know, your ability to attract talent at the end of the day. Um, you know, young folks are, um, more, more and more attuned to this this uh, this umbrella of, of corporate, you know, responsibility, and, and they want to work for uh, companies that that align with with their own values. And you know, if you're if you're not uh, in a place where you can articulate your values, it's it's tougher and tougher to, to attract the right types of people. So you know, that's a great um, point. I was having a conversation with a couple of companies uh, a couple of months ago, and we were talking about ESG, and they said, you know. Yeah. Are the new generation of employees, they were convenience store operators, they, they want to work for a company that they're proud of. 
They want to work for a company that shares their values. And today, given the tight labor market, man, attracting people is so much more challenging. I mean, is this really a tool that could be used to kind of recruit? I mean, heck, when we were growing up, and we're probably all in the same general demographics and generational, you're going to hire me? Great. Awesome. You know what? I don't really don't care what you do in the backyard. Just pay me. And let me do my job. But the new workers, the whole mentality has changed, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah well, we keep talking about the, the great resignation, about, about all the all the, the churn in the in the labor pool, and the more um, closer people are to hit the eject button. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's really something. I um, th- there was a you know this, this massive. Uh, vaccination debate that's kind of taken hold at, at every board level uh, worked its way into Raymond James recently, and, and I had some some insight. And you know, there was a there was a sub segment of the employee population when we went back and, and interviewed folks about you know the vaccine mandate in particular. Um, you know, if, if we force that upon folks, that there, there's a large percentage of our workforce that you know may, may not work for Raymond James the day that that's announced, and you know, I think that while it's it's not perfectly within the ESG umbrella, it just shows you that people are willing to to, to move if if prompted in, in that type of way. I mean, to your point, when, when I took my first job, um, got my first paycheck, I, I was uh, a loyal, committed, you know, soldier, and you know, it's 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 not necessarily the the same paradigm these, these days. Yeah, I mean, when I got my first job, I said, thank you, sir. Now, what do I need to do to make sure I get my second one? It wasn't now, what are you going to do for me next? (laughs) It was just, what do I have to do to make sure I don't lose that second paycheck coming my way? Um, Jeff, one of the challenges I I keep getting lost in is there are no regulations. So there really is no guidebook of definitive terms, definitive metrics that somebody needs to follow. I mean, you can talk about social. What does that mean? <clears throat> governance. Okay, governance, maybe that's a little bit easier to get your arms around. Environmental, I mean, right now everybody's talking about carbon, and it seems to be that's the the, the drumbeat. Um, I was speaking with a company a couple of weeks ago. I said, look, the only thing my investors want to hear about is our carbon emissions and our diversity. That's all they care about. Everything else they couldn't care less about. But Jeff, if I'm in a company, if I'm a business guy and I'm trying to figure out how to develop an ESG plan and how to uh, put forth what I'm doing and kind of take credit for the good stuff I'm doing, where do I start? I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't have a clue where to start. Governance, I can figure out. The rest of it, man, it seems the social stuff seems so political and the environmental stuff seems very challenging to really get your arms around. Yeah. I mean, our, our approach was to sit down with the industry. Um, number one, go through the existing frameworks that are out there. So there are there are frameworks, and it really starts with the GHG protocols developed by WRI, uh, and then that leads into SASB, GRI. I mean, there's frameworks. Everybody seems to have a new and improved framework um, that we can follow and we can pick from. So you know, as we as the Fuels Institute built out. ESG integrity as an application, we pulled we pulled what the feedback we were getting from industry as far as determining what's material. Where do we have hard data that we can we can track and collect? And then more importantly, how are we processing that data? Right? Because we start to, you know, people can start to, you know, work in black boxes. And and suddenly you're putting uh, data into an ESG report that people are going to question. Right? This, this is an industry that's going to always be accused of greenwashing, for example. So how do you how do you transparently, for example, calculate your CO two emissions? And so, you know, we we work with Argonne National Labs, uh, and we use the GREET model, for example. We update the GREET model. We look at uh, the national uh, the the grid. Uh, in the NERC regions and in the E-grid uh, regions to determine, you know, what, how can we transparently say um, honestly, openly, you know, look at our appendix. It's all in there. You know, uh, how can we crunch all of those numbers so that it's unquestionable? Uh, so, so yes, there really are, there's really no regulatory 
framework right now. We know that SEC is working on, on some proposed rules that should be coming out in quarter one. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, we're probably going to have some rules to follow. But in this voluntary period, it's really an opportunity. It's an opportunity for the company to go back and look at their uh, corporate sustainability report or, you know, historic reports and really kind of refresh that. And let's be honest, a lot of that is fluff. A lot of that is PR. Um, but there's still good stuff in there. You know, so how do we how do we take that and morph it into an ESG plan when we've got some fantastic messages? You know, for example, if you have, you know, 500 store clerks and each one of those store clerks are trained in recognizing criminal activity and human trafficking, you've now got a whole army out there facing the public that is doing a lot of good. So there's 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 good messages in there and there's metrics in there. 500 employees. This is what they're doing in their communities. I mean, that's just one example. Uh, there's multiple examples in there, but really it's it's finding somebody in your organization saying, okay, this is your, your, your designated the ESG contact person and then starting to collect that data. And that's what we're here for. You know, we're, tr we're trying to help industry uh, ferret out, you know, what's material, what's not, what, what aligns with the SASB frameworks or the GRI frameworks so that, you know, we can, we can build a good report that ultimately gets a good ESG score, which is a whole nother topic. You know, I mean, the ESG scoring protocols really do need some rules applied to them, but that's so John, I mean, we're doing. Jeff today. mentioned, how do we, how do we parse through the fluff and how mm -hmm. do we cut through the greenwashing? And so when you're yeah. looking at an organization and they go, here's our ESG plan. I mean, how do you go from, yeah, right to, this is really credible. I mean, what are you looking yeah. for in terms of those telltale signs? I'll let you know that this is something that is legit, that it's verifiable, it's credible, it's transparent compared to, well, yeah, look at, look over here, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Yeah, I think um, may not be perfectly qualified to be uh, uh, ESG diligence expert, but <laughs> I do know that there's certain pockets of um, the ESG umbrella that are, uh, you know, really important for this industry. That that are uh, good, good good to highlight. That you know, if you're if you're thinking about it in, in a M and A context. Um, the combination of, of two, two organizations, making sure those aligned is, is, is very important. Uh, organizations that ad advance your, um, your progression to towards the goals that you've outlined, you know, publicly, you know, internally, et cetera, I think is, is, is uh, a meaningful way to think about it. Um, you know, that there are rating agencies out there when, when you seek, you know, la larger forms of, um, debt financing that have their own, own scoring matrices that uh, com come, you know, into the into the process of securing capital for, for companies. Uh, you know, lender presentations uh, are, are now much, you know, that they when when you seek uh, debt that that's outside of your uh, just just local banking relationship, you're looking for a more syndicated offering that can be parceled out to other banks um, as part of that that marketing package uh, ESG is a big component of, of you know what what sits in those documents there, there's always a, a page or two dedicated to what they're doing um, so you know, you know I, I think it's you know to, to, to the broader point that, that Jeff is articulating you know, that there's lots of, of d data and, and greenwashing that, that's put out there for PR purposes. Uh, it, it will become standardized one day. I think right now, though, the more, more important focus for, for operators that, that I touch and that we speak to and advise uh, is to is to have a strategy. You know, start at the top, figure out what what the committee needs to look like, figure out what the what the policies you know need to look like, uh, figure out what what the organization's DNA is, what what its values are, and, and how you 
not just articulate those, but but ensure that they get instituted at the operational level, and you know may, maybe executive compensation aligns with with those you know aspirations as an organization. But you know all, all these things uh, eventually you know need, need to be um, uh, re- really woven into the into the uh, operations of, of a business. Yeah, I would Imagine I would add John to that, John. Nicole. You know. Some of the midstream folks that we've been speaking with, you know, as they're doing their mergers and acquisitions, what what they want to know is if I purchase this organization, what's that going to do to my basically my CO2 footprint? What's that going to yeah. do to my overall organization's footprint? And and it's just like doing a, a phase two environmental site assessment. You want to make sure that you know what the risk is in the ground when you're just purchasing a single C store. This is this is another risk assessment that it has to be accurate because otherwise, you know, you could possibly purchase an organization. And if it's not truthful and you're not getting um, the the full picture of the emissions that you're you're essentially buying uh, and folding into your ESG report. Now, all of a sudden. You know, here's here's a new risk that you weren't you weren't ready for. So that's why we really yeah. lean on the transparency of the GREAT model, you know, in in the ESG integrity application because uh, it's easy to see most and everybody uh, understands how that model works uh, and what goes into it. And, and that transparency is really important when you're talking about mergers and acquisitions. And that's that's where we're seeing people use it. Um, you know, in the industry right now. You know, I think your point of transparency, credibility, I mean, I saw an article a while back talking about a very large uh, company with a very big uh, market cap value and two different ESG evaluating agencies scored the company polar opposites. One gave them the worst score possible. The other mm-hmm. one gave them the highest score possible. And it was all about the assumptions. It's all about the data they were analyzing, the perspective they brought to it. And, you know, they were kind of, I think we're still kind of in the wild west until there's a little more standardization in terms of what constitutes a value, uh, valuable ESG metric. But I mean, what I'm hearing is you have to take it seriously because it's not a fad. This is not going to go away. Um, it's going to be around for a long time. It's been around a long time in different iterations, but it seems to be coalescing and getting a little more momentum in different venues, not just government, but financial institutions, social pressures. All these things are all kind of coming together, making this a higher uh, pr- priority for companies. And until we have a clear rule book, the best option, what I'm hearing from you, Jeff, is be transparent, use credible data, put forth everything you're doing and be honest about it. And then start, you know, tailoring how you present it as the rules come together. Is that a pretty good summary of where, if I'm in a, if I'm a business operator, I need to be thinking about? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. Because if you don't do it for your own company, somebody will do it for your company for you. And we, we already know that that's happening. Um, you know, there are groups out there that are, are using AI to assess your organization, and they will, they will provide a score for you. Um, which is not in most people's yeah. best interest. So, you know, I saw an article, and I think you're probably referring to the same article. I mean, where AI can analyze somebody's speech and determine the tone they use, the facial expression they use when saying certain words to determine how sincere they are and how credible it was. I'm thinking, I'm going, are you kidding me? This is Big Brother just yeah. completely blown up out of proportion. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 crazy. The, the the other piece too is is that it's really important for industry to stay ahead of it because we know that that those that are we'll call them early adopters, say during this voluntary phase, are going to have a seat at the table when we start when we sit down and start you know engaging in 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 um, proposed rulemakings uh, and building out like a regulatory framework. We know that the United States is already behind you know, compared to the EU and other countries. So, so there's going to be a period of time here coming up shortly where we're going to be faced with, you know, we need to be able to jump into these rulemakings. We need to make sure that, that, that our, our voice is heard. And the only way you can do that is by showing policymakers that, you know, this is what we've done. We've got skin in the game. 
you know, we are being proactive uh, and, and make sure we got a seat at the table during those processes. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. I, I think it's, you know, for, for, you know, folks looking to access capital to, to secure the best capital to, to, you know, enter the M&A market in particular. I mean, it's, it's a differentiator. It's a differentiator for sure. And it evidences a, a more thoughtful approach to, uh, uh, you know, the, the risk landscape that surrounds a business. Um, it evidences, you know, more, more foresight. It evidences you know, your ability to, to, you know, think through energy transition in, in a, a very thoughtful way and be prepared for it. Um, and and those, those those companies um, show show much better than than the folks that say, you know, this is this is something that big big companies are dealing with. It's not it's not you know something that I need to get concerned with until my local banker tells me my, my rates are going up, you know, a couple hundred basis points. And, you know, I, I, I don't I don't necessarily think that's the, the, the right uh, takeaway here. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today and talking to us on Carpool Chats. This, uh, this is a huge issue that we need to be diving into, and I know we're going to be diving into a lot more. If you guys back home watching us today, uh, you know, Fuels Institute has launched a new application called ESG Integrity. You might want to check that out. If you have questions about the financial perspective on ESG, you know, John at Raymond James is available. So thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode of Carpool Chats.